Thanks for tuning in to Thought Rock. Uh, this is a program that we're doing. My name is Dave Hensman. My good friend Mike Satterfield is here today. And we're talking about truth. We believe that we're at the beginning of a truth revolution. So, uh, Mike, glad that you're here with me, hanging out. Yeah, thanks for having me. We're going to take on this topic of truth, which is a massive topic. But you've done a lot of work on college campuses. I've done, uh, well, I've done a lot of work there as well and in other places. I tally that they've done over 7,400 presentations on different topics all over the years. I'm getting old. Wow. Yeah. But anyway, uh, <laughs> truth comes up through all of it, right? And, and truth is that foundational topic. It's the foundational um, issue that many people are wrestling with. What is truth? And I think people are really tired of being spoon-fed by the fake news. Yeah. Um, you know, college students in the academic in the academic industrial complex, which is what it basically is, are tired of being indoctrinated by an agenda. Right. Uh, people in churches are tired of getting spoon fed from pastors that are saying one thing and living something different. Sure. So I think there's a real hunger for integrity, honesty, and truth. People want to know what is true. I'm tired of. The establishment pushing stuff on. I want to. I need to figure it out. And I think there is a real thought revolution happening, and uh, we seek to be a part of that by yeah. doing this podcast. So we're going to take on that topic. So I I started by looking at okay, what is truth? I looked at Webster, Good American Dictionary, of course, right. eighteen twenty eight. Webster's came out. Yep. Here's his definition of truth: the body of real things, events, and facts, the state of being actual, something that is an actual fact. So something we can measure. Uh, the state of being the case, which is an interesting thing we'll look at as well. Um, transcendent, fundamental, or spiritual reality. Um, the fourth one is a judgment or proposition or idea that is true. So bringing something to the table, but once it's been analyzed, it's true. Uh, the body of true statements, so a compilation of true statements. And lastly, interestingly enough, he says God. Which uh, that's the ultimate truth. The ultimate truth, and so uh, he he's in the dictionary. So God made it. <laughs> Way <laughs> good, to God. Good for God. Yeah. Right. Well God done, you. Then then I went into Oxford's dictionary, and at okay. Oxford, of course, you know, um, I've got a little bit of English background in me, and the Oxford Dictionary, of course, uh, deals. This is kind of interesting. It deals with over six hundred thousand English words. Yeah, wow. And that's something. That's huge. It's, it's massive, and it's compiled over a thousand years of English study, and. When I, when I really realized that, I had to stop for a minute because that, that in and of itself just needs a pause. Yeah. Right? Well, when you consider how quickly we change the meaning of words in our culture, it's kind of an arrogant, it seems really arrogant compared to what you just said. Yeah, to just, with, kind of just to throw the dice at a word and say it's going to mean this now. Right. Um, you know, I look at, you know, a thousand years I mean, I, I think in my own lifetime of 50, um, a thousand years of study, um, men and women have come to this issue of words and they fought over them. They've argued, they've debated, they've developed. And so their work counts for something. It should. It should, right? And it at very least should humble us in today's culture when we think, okay, we're going to talk about something. Well, let's just make sure we choose our words carefully. Yeah. And I think the truth is a great place to start. So, <clears throat> truth, interestingly enough, is um, it came from the Germanic word originally, high German Germanic word, meaning trust and sworn loyalty or faithfulness. Mm. So you can see where that marries over to what Webster was talking about. All right. And um, and then we see it develop in 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 English English I should say England English 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 <laughs> United Kingdom to, English as opposed to French English no Chinese English to, to, to no, no, no. Canadian and American English well, that is something <laughs> yeah that, isn't yeah, that, yeah American English no, no, we're talking about what does that mean yeah oh thank you <laughs> talking to boot yes we're talking to boot it. Uh, I guess you can say that. You can attack that because you're not That's Canadian right. and I am. And, That's right. But I'll talk about, you know, you guys being on the roof right. versus the roof. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, 
So then Oxford goes on, and he gives about five, about five definitions that build on each other. And mm-hmm. I'm going to use this this little word uh, I coined, Yule, Y O O L. It's Year of Our Lord. I didn't coin it, but I just put it as Yule because I like I like using Year of Our Lord. I just something about that. But it just helps us go back over the thousand years. So, so just check this out for instance. So okay. Oxford says. The first thing, the truth is the quality or character of being true to a person, principal cause, a steadfast allegiance, faithfulness, fidelity, and loyalty. Now that was inputted into English around 1225. That's 800 years ago. Yeah. Okay. And then it moved on in, and, and prior to that, the, the concept of truth was loyalty or faith as pledged in a Solomon agreement. And that came from um, the marriage commitment or the marriage ceremony where a husband makes a pledge to his wife and they called it the troth or the truth. This is, the, this is my troth. Here I declare my troth, right? right? The old English word, yeah. which is here I declare my truth. And so the truth was basically, I'm going to commit to love you for my whole life till death do us part. You're going to commit to love me till death do us part. What was the proof of it? Yeah. The proof was... The loyalty. The the, time. Yeah. Yeah. So you could measure the truth of their commitment by observing their actions and lifestyle over time. Yeah. If the marriage dissolved, well, you know, well, you didn't... You you weren't truthful. That's right. But if it lasted till death, then you were a couple that exhibited and lived out that truthful, solemn commitment. Yeah. And that, that really left an impact on me as well, thinking of our current status today of family life right. and relationships. And there's almost, in some ways, you know, I, I even heard at one point some marriage ceremony uh, said, you know, uh, we will commit to each other as long as we both shall love. It was the most asinine Commitment I'd ever heard. What does that even mean? Let's just be honest. It's as long as we both like each other. Yeah, as long as we both feel like and it. And if I don't like you anymore, I'm out. Then I'm done. Right? That's, that's really what they're saying. So that kind of was infused into the meaning of truth. Thirdly, is the issue of honesty, uprightness, righteousness, virtue, and integrity to speak and act without deceit. Right. So kind of truth is then built on, right? It's like not only am I not only am I going to tell you the truth, but I'm coming to that and I'm I'm also removing any desire to deceive you. It's almost like an additional internal component. Yeah. It's like I'm going to tell you the truth, but I'm also going to make sure my heart is clean so that I'm not trying to pull something over on you in a little fine detail or a deceit. Right. Um that's that's deep. Yeah. When you think about it, yeah. Um, then the last or the next one was faith, trust, and confidence, which is kind of building again, um, which we've already kind of talked about. And then uh, the fifth one is a true statement, a report or account, which is occurrence with fact or reality. In other words, to report the matter as it really is. Um, I remember a lawyer friend of mine said to me he was he had a guy on the stand um, in a traffic matter and so the guy was had witnessed a traffic accident and uh, so he he was on the stand on Friday and the guy said uh, yeah I said well the 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 blue car came down the hill and hit the red truck yeah so that's fine so then on Monday he gets back on the stand he cross examines him again and and the guy said the purple car came down the hill and hit the truck. And, and the guy said, well, wait a second, on Friday you said it was blue, and now on Monday you, you said it was purple. Uh, which is it? He goes, well, uh, he, said, he said, either you're lying to me on Friday or you're lying to me today. Right. And the guy said, well, that was my truth on Friday. Uh, this is my truth today. Right. <laughs> okay. I hate that. I mean, you hear that increasingly? That's my, this is my truth. This is my truth. Share your truth. It's, it's like become a possessive, like truth belongs to me individually. In whatever arrangement I, 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 I set it forth, right? Hmm. I, hate, I there, there's uh, there's an appeal for some objectivity with the word truth, but it's like we're still trying to be subjective in our. We want it to be objectively true. We want you to receive what I'm saying, even though I'm saying this is my truth, but I still want you to believe it. So it's this weird. 
trying to be both objective and subjective at the same time. Yeah, it's just really strange. Yeah, it's almost like I I want I want to come with the authority of truth, right? But it's filtered through my yeah whatever yeah. experience, emotion, moment. Uh, well, yeah, whatever else you want to add to it. Yeah, and so it's not it's not really truth. Mm. It's your opinion. Sure. Maybe your feeling, or or maybe an honest current understanding that's not fully developed. Sure. That that's that's legitimate. That's fair. Sure. But this whole thing, and you hear it on talk shows all the time. Well, thank you for sharing your truth with us. And it's like this is my truth. It, it's 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 you're right. It, truth to me. And this is the humbling thing that I've, I've, it's been humbling me as I've been looking at this. Truth is so great and so big that I, I cannot, I don't know that I can possess truth. I need truth to possess me. Yeah. You know, I, I, I need to come to truth. I need to let truth be what it is. Uh, truth is brutal. What you're going to get to in a minute. Yeah. Before we move on, I just had a thought, and I, I had to scribble something down. There's a philosophical and theological, I think, reality in the lives of fallen men and women, and even people in the church, related to what you just described. It seems to be, it goes back to the lie of, of Satan in the garden. You, you will not surely die. You can be like God. Right. Right? And this idea that we can present our truth, I think... I'm seeing it has this, this subtle undercurrent of that same lie from the garden. Interesting. God is the one who speaks out right. of nothing and creates reality. And there's still this desire, I think, in fallen humanity to be able to speak our truth. Right. And it seems to correspond to this, this pattern that we see in Scripture where we're believing this deception that we can be like God in that way. And uh, I, I just I just feel like I see that on the rise right. in our culture. I think sometimes too when we when we are faced with actual truth that we don't want to deal with, mm -hmm. then we create our own. Right. And in a real essence, um, that's exactly what Eve did, both spiritually, psychologically, and yeah. intellectually. Yeah. She created her own reality by believing something yes. that was not true. Yeah. But then she made it her truth. Yeah. It, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a good point. That's, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, it's interesting in this whole to report the matter as it really is mm. concept. Now that kind of developed in 1200 uh, where they, they brought this concept of truth then must be able to be examined. Yeah. So this whole, con you know, you're coming to the table with an integrity and an honesty to truth. You almost have to have an allegiance and a faithfulness first. Yeah. It's almost like saying, well, I'm going to come to truth and whatever truth is, I will submit to it. Right. It, you cannot say, this is what I think truth is. No, truth stands on its own. Yeah. So I have to come, if I'm really going to seek truth, I have whatever truth is about any given matter, yeah. I, if I'm going to be an honest truth seeker, then I must submit to what the truth is. Yeah, it's a precondition. It's a precondition. And so here, this is reporting the the matter. It's interesting, in 1395, and the reason I'm throwing these dates in, because I, I think they're, they're, they're really interesting, because in 1395, the, the example used in the Oxford Dictionary to examine the matter was they used... Uh, Judges 16, 17 in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And it's the story of Samson right. with Delilah. Yeah. And how she was asking him, where's your strength? Yeah. Right? And he said, oh, strength. So if you bind me with them, bind me, if you bind me with ropes and new twine. You know, he was yeah. making up all kinds of stories, right? Right. And every time the enemy comes, he busts the bonds and, bound, and, he, and he fights him and he wins. Finally, he gives her... Yeah. That while my it, my my the, my hair is the symbol of my strength, you cut my hair, I'll lose my strength. Right. So in the Oxford Dictionary, they said the fact of the matter right. was when his hair was cut, and he was weak, that proved the truth of what he was saying. Yeah. So the truth was examinable. 
Right. And once examinable, it was evident. Yeah, and that's the basis of jurisprudence. Absolutely. Yeah. Which we use, well, we hopefully use in our court system. Right. Well, we used to. We used to. Oh, well, <laughs> Hit or miss. Depends where you go. <laughs> depends on the judge. Wow. Okay, so then the last little bit I wanted to talk about uh, before we get in, kind of get into other things about truth is the last kind of definition in Oxford. It says, understanding the nature of reality the totality of what is known to be true. So mm -hmm. to, 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 to look at what makes something real and, and what, what is knowable. Yeah. Now the word nature, I gotta just touch on the word nature because the word nature is, is a little bit of a frustrating word for me. Um, and you look it up and it, it, um, it, well, here's what, it, here's what it says even in Oxford. It says, in the broadest sense, it's the natural, physical, material world or universe. Nature can be referred to the phenomena of the physical world and also to life in general. The study of nature is at large not only part of science, although humans are a part of nature, human activity is often understood as a separate category from other natural phenomena. It's just... The definition of nature is vague at best. Right. It's just a vague meaning. But if you look at the the, the actual, again, root of the word, it's a French root. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the French root of nature actually comes from the, the Latin natura, which means birth. Now, see, I can get my brain around that. I right. can understand right. birth. Okay? So when I look at nature, I look at something birthed. That, that helps me. Something natural is something birthed. Um, and so birth is a word you can understand. It's a, word, it's a word you can kind of get your brain around. Nature's, too, to me, it's way too ambiguous of a word. It's vague. Mm -hmm. And so I don't even like using it. So, yeah. when I, so when I go back then to truth, and I think of this concept of you know, understanding how reality is birthed, yeah. Okay, that, that helps me. Yeah. Uh, when I look at what is known to be true, how was it birthed into reality? How does it, how has it come to be? Yeah. Um, that helps in, in, in the definition of that. Um, so, okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about how truth should be tested. Um, when, when someone says to you or says to me, well, this is the truth, how do you test that? in your yeah in your mind well I, that um, i'm always going to go back to um, the first time i read through the complete works of francis schaefer and then uh you know i told you you look a little bit like francis schaefer yeah a very young version yeah kind of a I'm going for you're kind of a georgian young version of Frankie <laughs> Sch francis schaefer i'm going for that I'm just so you got the goatee yeah, yeah 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 and uh, that's a good look yeah it's I, a good look okay. i think that's that's it that, that's it okay that, or or a, or a uh, slightly chubbier Donald Sutherland. I'm oh, sure. oh, yeah, that could work too. Yeah. Yeah, either way, I endorse yeah. both those looks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, yeah. they're good. They're good yeah. on you. That's where we're headed. Um, where are we talking about? <laughs> oh, teleology. No, theology. What, what are Truth. You well, I was, Truth. I was talking about how how do we test and measure? Truth. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I really appreciate uh, the apologist recently deceased whose name cannot be named among Christians for for uh, every for, for Bolton, um, Robbie. Uh, he introduced to me through his his materials the the two tests that uh, must truth must pass through. Uh, one is the correspondence test. Does it correspond to reality? Right. Truth must correspond to to what is. That's the first and most basic test. Uh, I used to play this game with the kids when we'd be on long drives through the country when they were all really small. And we'd be going through, you know, pasture land. There's cows, you know, sure. black and white cows. And dad, I, I'm in. I striven, strove. What is the striving? Past no. tense, whatever. Str I had, <laughs> whatever that is. I had striven. <laughs> yes. <laughs> strove did. To, I had strove did. Right, right. To teach my kids uh, logic, you know, <laughs> through comedy. Right. And and I would say, hey kids, look, 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 look at the field. There's lots of giant pink bunny rabbits. 
and mostly Abigail, who was the youngest, would would moan, you know, she, oh, Dad, those right. are cows, right? Because the, even at a young age, they know that a cow is a cow, a cow right. is not a horse, a cow is not a rabbit. That's correspondence. That's reality, right? Right. Right. And, and we don't have the freedom to just shift words around, otherwise it's, it's babble again. It's well, confusion. And that's a good point because the only reason why we have language is language is based on agreement. Right. Okay, it's all just sounds, and you have different languages, and yeah. we make different sounds, and because those sounds are agreed upon, those are words. Yeah. But those words have meaning. Yeah. And it doesn't really matter what language you slice or dice it in. It, it, it's, 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 this is a universal concept that yeah. every word we speak has a meaning, and for, for communication to be true and to be effective, those meanings have to be honored and valued. Absolutely. And so that's why I think... You know, the people, you know, tell the truth always. And if you can't tell the truth, don't lie. Yeah. You know, because words mean something. They do. And you're going to be known by the words you speak. Well, that's, that's a great segue into the second test, right? Not only does truth have to correspond to reality, tr truth claims must cohere within themselves. That they, they have to be true in correspondence and in, in coherence to one another. Right. Um, and that's... I think that's where most people get tripped up. Like if, if you're a good detective and a person's story is not cohering because there, there's contradictions there, sure. that's where you begin to go, I don't think that this is true, right? That's right. the telltale sign. Yes. So that for us as a culture, I feel like we're, we're losing both of those things. Um, watching the culture create new phrases or assign new meanings to words at the rapid pace at which we're doing that, I think is a sign of the rapid decay of culture. Of course. Um, and so, I, what I, I just told my kids, and they're all, they're young adult, you know, age 21, 19, and 15, but just said, you know, I don't want to ever hear the the epitaph Karen come out of your mouth. That's someone's actual name. Right. Some somebody's mom Na and dad right. named them Karen. And you, you're using it as a pejorative right. to insult a person when there are hundreds, thousands of people in, that, that, have, that bear that name. Right. I, I just think it's rude and obscene and unjust to right. do that. Right. And it's interesting when, when you talk about the, um, the whole concept of you know, words having meaning and, and, and examining these things. And about where culture now is declining, yes. quickly declining with the, 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 the flippant change of meaning. Yeah. And, you know, looking back over the history of a thousand years of study, okay, you can, you know, I have this, this angst when I see people thinking about, well, all of history was kind of brutish. Yeah. It was, you know, living, people living dirty in slums and, yeah. you know, all it's, it's only been the last hundred years that we've actually really been something. Right. And, and yet you go back and you see some of the greatest minds and some of the greatest right. thinkers of 500, 800, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. Go back into biblical history and you get, you know, back to five and six, yeah. and, you know, probably 6,000, 7,000 as far as back as you go in recorded history. Incredible intellectual minds. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And and all that we sit upon, all that we stand upon, is a composition of their work. It's a composition of their their efforts. And for someone to just throw caution to the wind and just change that because it's uh, it sounds great in a rap song or it's a rock and roll <laughs> phrase or some movie right. you know phrase or whatever or an insult like the Karen concept. To me, is it's like it's it's absolutely inexcusable. It's yeah. arrogant. It's it's pride at its amplified state. Absolutely. And I, so <clears throat> you mentioned this the fact that history is littered with great minds in high culture, and I think one of the things that, as I think as I think about the fact that a lot of people in our culture don't recognize that or appreciate that fact. Right. We do have a historical myopia, if you will, that we, we look at Western civilization in the last 200 years as being mm -hmm. the apex, the pinnacle of everything. And, and it's, I think that's founded on the myth of evolution. Since we're talking about truth, I think one of the presuppositions in the culture today, largely because of the indoctrination of the public school system, is 
Uh, well, ev evolution is true, right? Evolution, things have gone from chaos and sure. disorder over time to order and complexity. And so there's no way those people back then, 100, you know, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, could have been as cultured and thoughtful and intelligent. Right. It's, it's an assumption that's kind of buried in that yes. worldview. Yeah. And and I think it's led to a tremendous amount of arrogance in 21st century Western culture. Well, it just, just I don't know if you knew this, but it came on the news uh, last night, late last night, that uh, Darwin's arch in the, uh, in down in the, yeah. uh, per, in the, is it Gerlata? Where was that from? Where, the, where he did all of his uh, research? Oh, the Galapagos? Galapagos. Yeah. Thing. I was going to say Geropolis, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds like a Veggie Tale character or something. But, yes. but uh, yeah. But his his arch just collapsed. Yeah. So it, it was interesting. And I thought, you know, that's kind of symbolic a little bit. You know, evolution is a, it's it's kind of an outdated 18th century concept. Okay. Yeah. And I've said for 20 years that evolution. Evolutionary biology has been on a crash course with mathematical biology for 20 years, and mathematical biology is going to win. Yeah. And when you look, the deeper we look into the into the depth of, and this is probably another topic for another another <laughs> another podcast, so we'll we'll kind of bounce over pretty quickly. But but there there's a there's a, a collision that's come yeah. and and is coming, and it, we're seeing the evidence of it. I think with guys like Stephen Meyer and a lot of different people yeah. like that who have said, hey, listen, you, you just can't ignore the science right. of the, call it whatever you want, the architecture, the design, but there is there is an intelligent design behind these mathematical systems. Absolutely. And every living thing yeah. has a system yeah. from the way a flower grows to a tree to Absolutely. animals, life, fish, and us. And so, yeah, well, we'll, we'll come, I think we'll yeah, come yeah. back to that, but... But it's interesting coming to the truth concept. You're right. I think, I think that worldview being taught as fact. Yes. And I have no problem with it being taught as a theory. Sure. And and honest, honest, you know, teachers of it have said it's a theory. I have no problem with that. But we have not only taught it as we haven't given right. it, you know, equal time with other thoughts right. exactly. or other concepts, other worldviews, other worldviews, and so. So then it comes back to, then let's go test it. Right. Well, here's where the collision is coming for that worldview. Uh, with the advent of artificial intelligence, I think for, the, for even the, the rudimentary thinking student who's pursuing something in science, especially related to AI, should quickly come to the realization that AI did not develop on its own by random chance. Right. There's an intelligence behind artificial intelligence. There are human operatives and minds at work creating another intelligence because it would never have happened by chance. Right. And so how can you look at that, at the whole realm of artificial intelligence and what's being birthed in our day and still hold to an evolutionary, you know, Darwinian model of evolution right. that this is all right, you know, chance plus time randomness uh, I use the phrase lucky mud you know, yeah we're just lucky mud yeah um, I, I, it just doesn't make any sense those things are completely contradictory to one another in terms of the broadness of the what's required to bring about intelligence it's interesting because that even when uh, I even when the the DNA thing was first discovered by uh, dr. Watson in France and dr. Crick mm -hmm. um, Time magazine did a great big spread on that I, I still have a copy of it and and uh, it was fascinating because now, and both of those, you know, scientists were committed evolutionists. I mean, they they, yeah. they it said it said so, but it was interesting to me that in in all of the in all of the documentation they wrote about their findings, they used terms like the architecture of DNA, the design. They they used all these design mathematical architectural terms. Which I found fascinating because anytime you have something architectural or design, you have to take a step back and go, well, who was the architect? Who was the designer? And however you want to slice and dice that, 